Hey, church family, you'll be reading from John chapter 7, verse 53 through John chapter 8, verse 11. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote in the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older one. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we're thankful for you. We're thankful for your word and the encouragement we have from it. We're thankful for the living word, for Jesus and his example to us and his compassion on us. Father, as we think about uh, his interaction with this woman caught in the very act of sin and his mercy towards her, Father, I ask that it would move us and change us, uh, that his very character, his very being uh, would break our hearts and that we would go and sin no more. Father, I ask you with our church family as we study together virtually tonight, uh, that you would keep us warm, that you would fill our spirits. And we're thankful for the bond that we share through your son, Jesus. Lord, be with those that are still traveling in these conditions, that uh, are essential workers that have to be at their place of employment, keep them safe as they go to and from. Lord, we're thankful uh, to be your children that you are God. We pray these things to you now in the name of Christ. Amen. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all Yeah.
died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. Jesus rose for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus rose for all the children of the world. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, welcome to a Wednesday Night Bible Class with the Bartlett Woods Church of Christ. Uh, this is sort of an audible. We did not expect to have to have this online, but uh, grateful for technology for allowing us the ability to do that. Uh, Deliver Us is the class that we have been in that I have been teaching on Wednesday nights, and it's Lessons from Exodus. It's not a uh, walking through verse by verse of Exodus, but it's drawing lessons out of that book uh, and in all the incredible ways that God still provides deliverance for us. Someone on the internet site Reddit asked the question, what are some simple things that take forever? How would you answer that question? Here are here's some of the things they gave. Uh, I feel like laundry takes forever to go from dirty to folded and put up. Somebody else said, uh, anything at the DMV or post office. Uh, cooking, prep time, cook time takes way longer than I thought at first. Building credit, okay. Uh, painting my nails, haven't done that, but... I could imagine, all right? Grating cheese, grating cheese, all right? Trying to go to sleep. For some people, more than others, right? Uh, school, that's something someone put. One of the things somebody listed was making a roast. And then after that, they put, but it's so worth it. And I think that one kind of encapsulates a lot of the things in life that we feel like, man, this is taking longer than it should, or I wish I could just hurry up and get to the conclusion. But we know that there are certain things that there's a process. And if you try to force that process or you try to speed it along faster than it should go, things won't work out the way that they should. In one way, it might have seemed to some of the Israelites in Egypt before the Exodus that God was kind of taking longer than he should with the plagues, right? There were 10 plagues and continually going back and asking Pharaoh to let the people go and then uh, bringing on another plague. And why didn't God just get to the end and uh, perform the, uh, some kind of miracle that kept the Egyptians from following and lead the children of Israel out to the Red Sea? And if any eventually did follow, do what he did with the Red Sea collapsing already and just get to the end of it, uh, the answer is we don't know exactly why God did what he did. But of course, I believe that God's processes always see the greatest outcome and always accomplish the greatest purpose. So what might some of the greater good purposes of God have been in taking the time that he did in the plagues on Egypt? Well, here's one of the things that Exodus 10 verse 2 says, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So there's some purpose there in this display of God's power and the way that people would reflect back on that. Do you remember what Rahab says uh, in Jericho uh, when she hides the spies? I've heard. I've heard all of these stories about your God. And so everything that God did in Egypt caused a great remembrance upon people, not just in Israel, but other people who could reflect both on God's power and what the right thing to do is. Also consider another purpose of God's in giving Pharaoh every chance to do the right thing. And so God's process actually shows his justice in giving Pharaoh so many opportunities before just coming in and bringing the children of Israel out. All of this doesn't just remind them of God's power, it also reminds them of what will happen to the Israelites if they disobey the way the Egyptians did. If they become a wicked people, what's going to happen to them? And that impressed all of that upon them. This is what Exodus 15, 26 says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your healer. In the end it didn't stop them from becoming a rebellious people in many instances but there was always a righteous remnant that returned. 
we are often in our lives allowed to watch God work in ways that are not as quickly as we wish that they were. And then in the end, we look back and we see the times where we wished God had worked quicker, but maybe that wasn't the best way. Uh, and eventually we we're able to look back and see God's wisdom and God's power at work, weaving those things together for good, the way Romans 8.28 talks about. Sometimes we're allowed to undergo, like Pharaoh, our own stubbornness and the consequences of those things. And hopefully that builds within us not only the conviction not to do that again, but also helps us to see God's patience and love even more when we eventually turn back to Him and ask for forgiveness, and He's willing to do that. Take a look at, at Luke 7, 41 through 43. This is what it says. It says, A certain money lender, this is Jesus talking, A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. When God has forgiven us so much, even though we rebel and we turn back to him, it does recognizing our former lostness can help us to appreciate in an even greater way God's forgiveness and God's mercy. Think about John Newton who wrote the song Amazing Grace. Right? It says, saved a wretch like me. But John was formerly a slave trader. Right? And, and he realizes his lostness, and because of that, the justice and mercy of God is highlighted all the more. Habakkuk 1.3, Habakkuk asks, Why do you make me see iniquity or look upon iniquity? Uh, God allowing the evil things that take place, and Habakkuk is watching them, wondering why God's not doing something. Well, not only do we believe, based off of his track record and who he is, that God is working things out for the greatest good, even within the things he allows to take place, but it also has this dual purpose of being allowed to see iniquity and in order that we might see the consequences of those things and not want to go down that path, which is essentially the message of uh, Exodus 15, 26, right? You saw the devastation in Egypt. Do not follow their path. But just because we find ourselves doing the right thing and taking that right path doesn't mean that we avoid every kind of difficulty in life, right? Sometimes there are unique difficulties that come with following the right path. In fact, Moses finds himself at the center of God's will in going to Pharaoh to ask him to let the people go. And yet, because of that, he's placed directly up against some fierce opposition. Not only Pharaoh himself, but then the people. In fact, when Moses asked Pharaoh initially for that three-day journey into the wilderness, what happens after that? Uh, Pharaoh tells the people of Israel that they not only have to make the same amount of bricks that they were going to have to make before, but they're not going to be provided the straw to make those bricks. So they got to find their own straw, which means that the Israelites have to spend a lot of time finding the straw, but they're still required to make the same amount of bricks. And when they don't meet the quota, the Israelite taskmasters are beaten. So then this happens in Exodus 5. Look at verses 20 through 23. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, this is the people, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. So it seems like doing the right thing made things worse for the people than better because it didn't work out exactly the way Moses hoped it would. He'd go to Pharaoh, Pharaoh let him go. and it, The process was going to look different than Moses thought, and those difficulties were going to accomplish something greater. And yet at the beginning, it was confused. I'm trying to do the right thing, and all of a sudden things have gotten even worse. But then God makes Moses some promises that help him to keep the faith through all of this. Look at Exodus 6, verse 1. It says, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them, and give them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will 
will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. John Newton, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace, again, uh, he talks about our heavenly inheritance and how we should think about that in light of the difficulties that we go through. And he said that Christians shouldn't murmur or complain through difficulties and, and go into despair because of that internal inheritance. And he says, imagine a man who just inherited an enormous estate and he's got to go to New York to receive it. And so he takes his carriage there and on the way there he's one mile left before his destination and he, uh, he his carriage breaks down. Can you imagine him just complaining, oh, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken, and despairing? Or would he just pick up and go the extra mile and the excitement of the fact that he's about to get a million dollars one more mile? Newton's not trying to say that our difficulties aren't difficult or say that it's, it doesn't grieve us or even that it doesn't grieve God that some of those things take place. But he is trying to help us to keep perspective that within this life, in light of eternity, the things that we suffer here really are not uh, to be compared with the weight of glory. And that's exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. You look at verses 16 through 18. Paul writes, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God intends to instill this same kind of perspective with Moses because this is going to be a long road ahead with these plagues and then coming out of Egypt and the deliverance is not going to come as fast as they would like it. And for the Israelites, there's going to be some difficulty as well with these things that take place like we've already seen. But God gives Moses this future promise to hold on to in order to keep faith and perspective during the difficulties in the here and now. And I want to look at some of them because there are these I will statements of God that are spoken with certainty and they're actually timeless and they should be dwelt on by us as well because they have New Testament parallels for an even greater deliverance through Christ. The first one is liberation. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. What is the New Testament parallel here? That Jesus has redeemed us from the slavery of sin. Galatians 1.4 said Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. What types of things should that future promise help us with and give us perspective on to help see us through? Well, first of all, it gets rid of the burden of the things we've done in the past. It gives us the forgiveness of those sins. And so the past is wiped away and we don't have to carry that guilt because Christ has forgiven that. But then there's also the help to conquer sin in the here and now. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That there will be a help through those difficulties, a door of escape. That there is something being worked out within us, according to James 1, 2 through 4, when we go through trials, even if those trials don't have to do with sin or temptation, but the difficulties and trials that we face, Christ is sanctifying us through those things. He is building our patience. He is building our character. And then also there is hope that we will be delivered from the presence of sin altogether. We won't struggle with that anymore when we're in heaven. We won't deal with that at all. The second one is adoption. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God, he says to Moses. If they were already the people of God through Abraham, then what does he mean that I will be your God and you will be my people? The emphasis isn't on making them a certain lineage that they already are, but it, the emphasis is rather on God's decision, his, his choice to remain in an active relationship with them. He doesn't intend to free them from Egypt and then let them go on their own. He will be their God. He will consistently maintain authority and governance and his commitment to taking care of them and making them his people. It is the emphasis on that active ongoing relationship and what he intends to do even after the deliverance. Where is the New Testament parallel here in the adoption promise? 
God has rescued us from sin. And yes, that's part of that deliverance, just like bringing the people out of Egypt. But he intends to continue that relationship with us. In fact, adoption is one of the key words used for what we have through Christ in being reconciled to the Father. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 describes an adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. What kind of things does that help us to persevere through? What kind of things does that give us help with in struggles and difficulties in this life? Well, one thing it gives to us is that God has saved us into a family. There are people who don't have a lot of physical family and there are people who face opposition or not supported by their physical family maybe it's the case that they were but when they became a Christian they were no longer supported by their physical family every Christian on the planet has a family it doesn't really matter what the situation is with their physical family every Christian on the planet belongs to the family of God and that's something that God has given to us he didn't just save us as individuals and leave us out there to do life on our own he gave us a family within the church but another thing it deals with is a, a sense of worth and self-esteem and value. Why? If you belong to God, if you are a, a child of God, the creator of the universe, the most powerful, the most righteous being in existence, does the opinions of other people about your worth really matter? <laughs> does your value come from the fact that you work hard? Does it come from uh, your contribution to society, your standing in society? No, it doesn't. Those things may increase your value and worth within a societal structure, but they have nothing to do with your inherent value as made in the image of God and then twice redeemed, twice a child of God. Once by being made and created through Him and declared as good in His image, but then being adopted and redeemed by Him. Even after all that we've done, God values us uh, as much as He does, um, leading even to the death of His own Son. And so it can help us through those times where we might struggle with value or worth. The third one is glory. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. Where is the New Testament parallel to this? Well, of course, the, the New Testament plays on the idea of the future promise. And 1 Peter 1 verse 4 says we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Romans 8 verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What type of situations does the hope of heaven and glory away from pain and suffering and tears, what kind of things does that help us as we struggle through? All of it, right? There's, there's not really any of our struggles that aren't made better by the fact that there is a world free of pain and struggle that we are promised no matter what happens to us in this life. With that type of promise, what would possess Moses uh, to go and try and make a permanent home in Egypt or to have made a permanent home in Midian? He decides to go ahead and stand before Pharaoh, even though he makes a lot of excuses and it's difficult for him. In the end, Moses remains the type of person he was uh, in his decision not to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hebrews 11 puts it this way in verses 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. When talking about going through struggle and looking forward to heaven, looking forward to glory beyond what we deal with now, Elizabeth Elliot wrote this. Once we have set ourselves to be pilgrims and strangers on the earth, which is what Christians are meant to be, it is incongruous for us to continue to insist upon the sort of security the world tries to guarantee. Our security lies not in protecting ourselves from suffering, but in putting ourselves fully into the hands of God. The desire for physical and material security makes us sly and hard. No, we must be like little children. It lies quietly at rest because... It trusts its father. When my kids are in trouble or they're crying or something has happened or there's a situation that needs to be dealt with, when I arrive on scene, when I swoop them up, when I'm hugging them, before I have given them any kind of explanation for how we're going to deal with the situation, they are already comforted by the fact that they know I will. They know that they, they don't have to know all the details of what I'm going to do, but they know that once I arrive, they believe that I will have the ability to do something to help them. Now, it may be a little, uh, a little too much trust in my abilities because there are things that I cannot do and cannot 
uh, make better. But because of my track record of coming in and being able to help, at least to a degree, to make things better, they trust that I can again. And if they trust in a human father in that way, how much more should we trust in the creator of the universe that even though we may not know exactly how he's going to pull this off, just like Moses and the Israelites might have wondered when they first went to Pharaoh, Moses went to Pharaoh and it didn't work out the way he thought. How is Pharaoh going to... I think it's quite amazing that God says not only is Pharaoh going to let them go, he is going to let them go with a strong hand. He's going to make them leave. Right? For Moses to, to go from uh, Pharaoh's doubling down and digging his feet in and you saying he's going to like force them to leave eventually it's kind of the quite the opposite but Moses doesn't have to understand the how if he trusts in the future promises of God if he trusts in who the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob was who saw them through the impossible many times then he can do it again and so for us we trust because of who God is and because of his track record because of his power that he can do for us what he did for the people in Egypt what he did for Abraham Isaac and Jacob what he did for all the servants who were faithful to him throughout centuries so I hope it's not original to me but I hope you'll remember those three promises the liberation the adoption and the glory that parallel what God promised to Moses but because of the greater than Moses Jesus we have in an eternally greater way let's pray as we close God, we're grateful for the chance to be able to trust in you. We're grateful for your love, for your deliverance. We're grateful for Jesus who brings that about. We pray, Father, that you give us strength and courage. Father, we do pray for things uh, often to work out the way we would like them to. But we always pray for your will because we know ultimately, Father, that you know what is best for us. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to hold your, uh, to hold your hand through those things. Father, we pray that you keep everyone safe out in the weather. And we're grateful for the time we are able to share together and study. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end.